Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the alternating groups. Okay, so, in the previous video we defined the sine function which maps the symmetric group on the set of n elements onto the set containing plus and negative 1. Okay, and remember we called this epsilon. So epsilon was the sine function and it took every permutation in the symmetric group on the set of n elements and mapped it onto either plus 1 or negative 1. And remember the way that this works. The way that we define this is that you take your set permutation and you act it on the polynomial delta n and you ask when we act sigma, let's say, for our set permutation on this polynomial, does it flip an even number of terms of the polynomial or an odd number of terms in the polynomial? And if it flips an even number of terms in the polynomial, we give it the sign plus 1. And if it flips an odd number of terms in the polynomial, we give it the sign negative 1. OK, so that's what, where we've got up to in the previous video. What I want to do in this video is take this mapping and make it more. At the moment, it's just a mapping of one set onto another set. What I want to turn this into is a group homomorphism. OK, so to do that, what I'm going to have to firstly start off by doing is turning this thing into a group, because at the moment it's just a set. OK, so to turn it into a group, I'm going to define a group composition table on it. OK, and I'll call this group composition table multiplication. So I'll give each of the symbols in this set a column and a row. So here's plus 1, negative 1. Here's plus 1 and negative 1. And now let's go through and define the entries. So plus 1 is going to be our identity. So plus 1 times plus 1 will equal plus 1. Plus 1 times negative 1 will equal negative 1. Negative 1 times plus 1 will equal negative 1. And negative 1 times negative 1 will equal plus 1. So here, this is going to be the composition table that I'm going to define on the codomain of this function here. OK, so now both the domain and the codomain are groups. So we can hope. We can pray uh, that this actually is going to end up being a group homomorphism, and indeed, the fact that this is a group homomorphism is absolutely central to making any further conclusions that we want to make about the sine function, i.e. aiming towards our goal of trying to uh, say that this captures this idea of set permutations having a certain parity uh, when you decompose them into successions of transpositions. OK, right. Uh, so how am I going to prove that this is a group homomorphism? Well, of course, to prove that it's group homomorphism, I have to prove that it obeys the property of homomorphisms. Now, what is the property of homomorphisms? Well, the property of homomorphisms is that for all, uh, let's say, sigma 1 and sigma 2 that you can possibly select from the domain group here, so all sigma 1 and sigma 2 from the symmetric group on the set of n elements, it must be the case that if I take the sign of sigma 1 composed with sigma 2, where of course this composition is in the symmetric group on the set of n elements, so here sigma 1 composed with sigma 2, that means composition in the symmetric group on the set of n elements. If you firstly compose them in the symmetric group on the set of n elements, and then take the sign of that, uh, the answer to that composition, it has to give me the same answer, the same sign, as if I firstly took the sign of sigma 1, so I took epsilon of sigma 1, and then composed it in the codomain group, which of course is multiplication here, with the sign of sigma 2, like so. So this is in the codomain group here. So I'm going to have to prove that this is true in order to prove that this is indeed a group homomorphism. OK, so the question is, why is this going to be true? OK, well, I think the best way to do this, rather than trying to come up with some incredibly clever argument, and indeed in many of the textbooks they do come up with incredibly clever arguments for this, I think the best way to do it is just by sheer brute force. OK, we've only got four different cases here. OK, and let's just go through them and actually check them one by one uh, and see that this result does indeed hold true. Now, before we can do that, we do need to understand the left-hand side here a little bit better. What does it mean to take the sign of sigma 1 composed with sigma 2? Well, of course, to take the sign of a certain set permutation in the symmetric group on the set of n elements, what you have to do is let your set permutation act on the polynomial delta n and see how many times, um, or rather how many terms, get 
flipped when uh, that set permutation acts on the polynomial delta n. Okay, so if we're going to let this answer to delta 1 composed with delta 2 act on the polynomial delta n, then I will just copy out our polynomial delta n so that we've got it in front of us. So delta n, remember, is equal to the product of xi minus xj, where i is strictly less than j, and j can be less than or equal to n, and i is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so here's our polynomial. So remember, what we want to do here is let the answer to this act on all of these indexes and see what we end up with. But what we can actually do in order to do that is we can firstly let sigma 2 act on the polynomial, and then let sigma 1 act on what's left over after sigma 2 has acted on it. Okay, and when I say this, I mean don't bother to pull out the negative 1 to the certain power. Okay, previously when we did this, we let a set permutation act on the polynomial, and then we pulled out negative 1 to a certain power to return it back to what it was before. Don't bother anymore. Just count the number that have flipped, and that's the way we'll uh, decide whether it's even or odd. Okay, uh, so you let sigma 2 act on the polynomial, you'll get some new uh, polynomial, okay, and then you just leave it as it is, and then let sigma 1 act on what's left. Again, it will just act on all the indexes, change them a little bit, and then we'll see what we've got overall then, and we'll have a look at how many of the terms have flipped. Okay, and I can still be sure that every term will appear, either flipped or not, uh, because both of these maps would be injective, uh, i.e. bijective, because it's finite, um, and therefore when you compose them together it's still going to be the case that the final thing that you're ending up with is still going to have every single term. Okay, right, so that's what we have to do here. We have to firstly do sigma 2, then do sigma 1, and then count overall how many terms have been flipped, and decide whether it's even or odd. Okay, so let's just go through the different cases here. So let's start off with the case that both sigma 1 and sigma 2 are even. Okay, so that means the sign of them will both be plus 1, and therefore the right-hand side is going to be plus 1 times plus 1, which will be plus 1. So we better hope, therefore, that the sign of an even permutation composed with an even permutation is another even permutation, i.e. when I compose an even permutation with an even permutation, I need to get an even permutation. Okay, and if that's true, then I can tick off case 1 here, I can tick off this quarter of the composition table. Okay, so that's the approach that I'm going to do. I'm just going to go through the four different cases and verify it. Okay, so why is it true then that when I uh, compose two even permutations together, I'm going to get another even permutation? Okay, well, think about this. We let sigma 2 act on delta n first. That will flip an even number of the terms here. Then we let sigma 1 work on what's left over, and again that will flip an even number of the terms. Why then does the thing that you overall have, have an even number of terms flipped? Okay, well what you have to remember is that, the, well the one complexity here is that what if sigma 1 flips back some of the uh, terms that sigma 2 flips? I mean if they were flipping totally different terms then it would be obvious that uh, the number overall that they flipped would be even, because you'd have an even number of plus an even number, and that will make an even number. But the one complexity here is that what if sigma 1 flips back some of the terms that sigma 2 flipped? Well, I claim that doesn't bother us, because if that occurs, then effectively you cross off one of the flips that sigma 2 did, and you cross off one of the flips that sigma 1 did, i.e. overall it's just going to subtract 2 off the overall number of flips that uh, is present in the final polynomial. And that's not going to change whether the answer is odd or even at all. Subtracting off an even number 2 doesn't change whether a number is odd or even. Okay, it keeps it the same. And that's why you don't ever have to worry in any of these arguments about uh, what if sigma 1 cancels out some of the flips of sigma 2. And that's why truly, yes, when we compose two even permutations together, we're still going to end up with an even permutation. So indeed, case 1 is... Uh, done. Okay, and in fact, the same argument that I've just applied works for all of these, but I'll go through the f other three separately just to reiterate the argument to you, and hopefully by the time I've finished you will understand the argument completely.
Okay, so let's now go through uh, case 2 here, so plus 1 times negative 1. So we're going to assume that sigma 1 here has sine plus 1, and therefore is even, and sigma 2 has sine negative 1, and therefore is odd. And what we want to prove is that if you compose an even and an odd permutation together, overall what should it be? Well, plus 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, so it needs to be odd. So when you compose an even with an odd permutation, I want to prove that you get an odd permutation to verify case 2 here. Okay, so why is that going to be the case? Well, firstly do the... Uh, which one's this one? This is the odd one. Sigma 2 is the odd one. Firstly do the odd one. That will flip an odd number of things. Then do the even one. That will flip an even number of things. Okay, and again, the it would be obvious then that the result was an odd permutation if it was true that both of these were flipping distinct terms. Okay, because then you'd just be adding an odd number to an even number, and of course that's an odd number. The one complexity is, what if this one flips back some of the things that this one flipped? Okay, uh, but that doesn't matter because again, you'll cross one off from here and one off from here, so overall from the overall number you'll just subtract off two, and that doesn't affect whether it's odd or even. It maintains an odd number as an odd number if you subtract off two. Nine take away two, for instance, is seven. Seven is still odd. Okay, so subtracting two off an odd number does not change the fact that it's odd. Okay, so that's why it doesn't matter if sigma 1 cancels out some of the flips of sigma 2. So indeed, uh, yes, this is going to be odd, and case 2 is verified. And the other two follow the exact same pattern, but I'll go for it as I say again. So now this next one, negative 1 times plus 1, so we're going to assume this time that sigma 1 is odd and sigma 2 is even. Okay, and what we want to prove is that sigma 1 composed with sigma 2, the sign of that needs to be minus 1 times plus 1, which is negative 1, so it needs to be an odd permutation. So we want to prove that odd composed with even gives me uh, an odd permutation. So you'd firstly do the even permutation on here, that would flip an even number of terms, then you'd do the odd permutation, which would flip an odd number of terms. And again, if they flipped completely distinct terms, i.e. this one flipped different terms from this one, then it would be obvious that overall the number of terms flipped would be odd, because you just add the odd number to the even number, and that would be how many terms you've overall flipped. The one complexity is what if this one flips back some of the ones that this one flips, but that doesn't matter because you're just going to subtract two overall of the total number of flips, and that doesn't change whether the number is odd or even. Okay, so that's absolutely fine, and indeed this will end up being an odd number, so I can tick that one off as well. And then finally, the final case, case four, which is where both of these are odd permutations, Okay, so their signs are both negative 1, and I want to prove that the composition of these two, um, the composition of the two odd permutations, needs to have sign plus 1, negative 1 times negative 1, i.e. it needs to be an even permutation. Okay, so why is that going to be true? Well, uh, you'll firstly do sigma 2, that's an odd number of flips, then you'll do sigma 1, another odd number of flips, Again, if they were totally distinct, it would then be obvious that uh, the permutation would be even, because you just add the odd number of flips to the odd number of flips and get an even number of flips. Overall, the complexity comes from the fact that sigma 1 might flip back some of the ones that sigma 2 has already flipped, and therefore you'll just have to subtract off 2, but that will maintain the number as even, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so there is the argument as to why this homomorphism is true. We've just gone through all of the four cases and verified that it is the case that this is indeed a group homomorphism. Okay, so these two groups are homomorphic. It is true that if you want to work out the sign of two permutations composed together like this, sigma 1 composed with sigma 2, you can just work out the sign of each of them and then multiply them together in this multiplication table. Okay, so truly, uh, if you compose two even permutations together, you will get another even permutation. If you compose two odd permutations together, you will get an even permutation. If you compose an even and an odd permutation together, you will get an odd permutation either way round. Okay, so we'll have a break here whilst you swallow the fact that this is a group homeomorphism, and in the next video what we'll do uh, is take this further. We will firstly calculate the sign of a transposition, We'll then talk about the fact that this is a subjective homomorphism, and then we'll understand how truly this captures the concept of how many uh, transpositions a certain uh, 
set permutation is going to have in, its, uh, in any transposition decomposition of itself. 